birthday. On our hero, Oscar Fingler Flaherty, Will's wife, in fact, we've got a little 155th birthday badge on the graphic behind you, you may notice. Um, I have said before, and I make my apology for saying again, if you've heard that I've said it, that each year that passes, Oscar seems to become a greater figure. It isn't difficult to see why his um, reputation has been enhanced since his death, because few people had a reputation that was lower. <laughs> his life was in ruins. It was an appalling end to a career that had been so brilliant. I'm not going to go through the entire biography of Oscar. I'm sure most of you know roughly the story. He came from an Irish family, an Irish Dutch family, as a matter of fact. Vinda was, was an Irish man on his father's side. On his mother's side, he came a good Irish stock. His mother had the, uh, the nickname Speranza. She was a writer for fierce in her views of Irish nationalism. Although he was from a Protestant family, what was known in Dublin in those days as the Protestant ascendancy. In other words, they were the ones who ran things on behalf of the royal family and the empire. Indeed, his father, Sir William Wilde, uh, was uh, an ophthalmic optician who was the Queen's eye surgeon. Should Her Majesty ever have been in Dublin and had a problem with her eye, he would have been the one who would have dealt with it. That's as close as he ever got to Queen Victoria, the possibility of being her emergency standby should she have visited. And Wilde grew up in uh, pretty, much, um, pretty much a privileged way. He went to private schools. He was very brilliant, very young. In, in a very particular way. He's mostly verbal, which won't surprise you, given his reputation. Um, his brother, William, uh, used to win bets by handing books at school, big, thick books that they, someone would pluck at, at random from the library to give to Oscar. And uh, when Oscar was about seven, eight, all the way up to sort of 12, and Oscar would read like this, about his speed. <laughs> And then they would test him, and he would be able to reproduce what he'd read. I mean, not necessarily word for word, but he could describe precisely what he'd read. He was able to read, in other words, very, very fast. And he was able to speak languages well, in particular, of course, in those days, it was Latin and Greek. And he, um, he excelled himself, was really the finest Greek scholar in particular uh, of his generation at Trinity College, when he went to that old caste institution as a young man. And he was clearly destined for good things. And in those days, if you were destined for good things, you went to Oxford in, in England. Great things, of course, you would have gone to Cambridge. But, <laughs> <laughs> there are many stories about Oscar at, at, at Oxford. It's where he made his name. He really began to make his name. He, he met Walter Pater and, uh, and Ruskin, and these great figures of the aesthetic movement, as it was called, although they were very different, Ruskin and Pater. There was a general sense that there was a new movement afoot in Victorian England. Uh, which was to do with a, an understanding that beauty was, in a sense, much, much more than skin deep, that you could have a science of beauty, aesthetics, and you could also have a kind of moral cult of beauty, in which beauty was considered to be a good, in the way that John Keats famously considered it to be a good. And Wilde was once asked as an undergraduate if he had any great ambition. He said his greatest ambition was to live up to his collection of blue and white china. <laughs> it's probably hard for us to imagine just how shocking such a statement was to a, a Victorian, uh, a kind of uh, rugby hunting um, Victorian on the one hand, or the dour um, inheritors of the world of Thomas Arnold, the musket Christians, the, uh, the, the serious and sober frock-coated Victorians on the other, to have this burst of light, this burst of linguistic brilliance and light uh, appear uh, with, as someone once said, not um, not the, the brogue of Irish, but with the lilt of Irish in his voice. A very beautiful speaking voice, a very measured, quite low speaking voice. 